No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. I'm here with Ryan Holiday, our second time doing an interview. How you doing, man? I'm good. A lot's changed since last time. Got a well, new spot. New, new spot. Show blew oh, up. God, dude, we were downtown last time. Downtown yeah. was a whole thing. A lot of roaches. Ugh. Um, yeah, I was, we were just having a conversation about these uh, kendamas because it's 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 weird. Like when I'll, I'll always recommend this kind of thing. Like you were just asking me if I compare it to BMX in my head, and I totally do. And I feel like that's a big part of why I'm such an advocate for kids getting into stuff like BMX, skateboarding, kendamas, etc. Because I feel like it's a very good introduction to having something in your life that you're in control of that you can learn using, and then that can sometimes be a good stepping stool towards progressing other parts of your life. I know for myself, I never really felt like I had something that was rewarding, where I felt like I was in control of my own destiny until I started riding BMX bikes and I was able to sort of manifest that through that. And I think that a lot of kids who really have like a a sense of pointlessness and despair, a lot of it sort of comes back to the fact that they just don't have that confidence that they can accomplish something new for themselves. And I think this is kind of just like a a good entry point towards building up that that motivation. I think the drive to mastery is like one of the most important parts of the sort of what makes humans human special Mm. and like most kids particularly kids who come from shitty circumstances nobody ever encourages them to do that to say like you can you can become like world class at this thing Mm -hmm. i think some kids get sports so that's like a huge outlet obviously lots of white kids and and uh you know upper middle class kids get all sorts of academic opportunities to to do mastery you know but uh but very few people are encouraged to just take something, even if it's not an important thing, and just figure it out. Break it down and figure it out and get better and better and better and better at it. But mm. that's that's what that that skill is transferable, whether you're getting really good at BMX or skateboarding or fucking yo yo or or writing or, you know, playing the guitar. Like I think these things are really important. The problem is we teach kids to like play the cello because we think it'll get them into Harvard, not because like, hey, the mastery of an instrument mm. is like a transferable skill. For you, was that writing? Writing was it? But for, I was into music at first, uh, but I wasn't very good. Like I, I got, I fell in love with that process of like getting good at something and expressing myself. It just took me a couple starts and stops to figure out like actually my best medium was writing words like Mm. in books you know like for in what would become books but that obsession with with like i'm going to figure this out and i want to consume and learn from everyone that's ever been good at it that's that's what keeps you out of trouble but it also is a it's a positive feedback loop right because the better you get at it the more you get out of it and then the more opportunities it presents and it it just keeps you focused on what matters. I can give you that clear-headed approach, like the, that feeling of, of accepting and knowing that you're bad at something and then being able to work past that and get good at something is, you know, that, that just knowing that you don't have to be what you were yesterday is yeah. something that a lot of young kids just never really get started on that prog- progression of just building upon that idea. When also, like, you know, my, I've been writing about stillness and that's what the new book is about, but like, what you have with that, what you also have with BMX, what I have with writing, what I have with running, what I have with swimming, that place you get to when you're doing that thing and you lose track of time and you lose track of noise and you're just like in a flow state where you're just fucking doing it, that's the, that's the real pain. That's when mm-hmm. you're like, when were you last happy? It was when I was like crushing it on something like right. that. Not like the rewards, not the numbers, not the recognition. It was like I got lost in it. Yeah. And when people say flow state, is that the same thing that you're referring to when you say stillness? Yeah, I, I think that's one that's one kind of a that a flow state is a kind of stillness or stillness can manifest itself in the form of a flow state, but it's not always there. It occurred to me when I started reading your book on a flight on my phone, which I never yeah. do. I always yeah. I love the physical copy of the book, which you you're still the same way you do totally. almost Only all your reading. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because you have that uh, thing that's always in your newsletter where you say, I always promised myself that I would never let money get in the way of yeah. reading everything I wanted to read, something along those lines. Yeah, like I hear from people that like, I stole your book from a store. I'm like, okay. You know, like, <laughs> like one, I respect you sent this email, but like, and I wish that you wouldn't steal from bookstores, like of all the of things, all places, of all the places geez, to yeah. rob, like these are like businesses, but, but I respect the hustle mm. in that like, you didn't steal like 
alcohol, you stole something that has like a positive ROI in your life. Right. You know, it might predict the future where they wouldn't be shoplifting if they get a lot out of the book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and by the way, there's also a place where they give away free books. They're mm. called libraries. God, I read the best quote about that the other day. They said, can you imagine if libraries didn't exist, how controversial the idea of a library would be? Totally. You imagine that if like if a if Elizabeth Warren is the president in a year from now and she says we're going to open these buildings where you're going to be able to read whatever book you want, it would be considered to be the most controversial concept imaginable. Yeah, of course, it's it's a wondrous gift to humanity, yeah. and people go, I can't afford to read, or I don't have time to read, bullshit. Mm. Yeah, I think my mom being a librarian and having her come home every day just filling me with stories about other people learning and people sort of overcoming adversity and things along those lines that that was hugely informative of my whole life of just kind of always being reminded of that and always having her to bring me you know 20 copies of a new magazine that I wanted to read or just bring me whatever book she had seen on the young readers list or whatever <laughs> Well, look, reading is a thing like BMX or this game or oh, whatever, yeah. too, right? Like, you're like, the more you do it, the more you get out of it, the the different things you can explore, the things you didn't even know existed. Right. And so it that's a feedback. I think the problem is, like, in school, we go, like, smart people read. Or we just go, like, you got to read or you're not going to get good grades. Mm. Or we go, like, The Great Gatsby is a beautiful book. That those That's the extent of the argument we make. We don't go, like, hey, inside books is the greatest, most valuable collection of knowledge in the history of the world, why would you not avail yourself of this? Like, that, what we don't make the case with reading is that there is a real ROI. Mm. Like, that, like, for 15, like, so that, let's say this book is 15 bucks or whatever on Amazon. That's, like, two years of my life. What I, the rate I consult at for companies, that would be cumulatively, like, the amount of hours that I spent, if you took my consulting rate, this book would be worth literally millions of dollars. Mm. You can buy it for 15 bucks. You know, I'm not making a pitch for my book. What I'm saying is that s billionaires write books about their strategy for how they became a billionaire. Uh, rappers write books about how their musical, like, Jay-Z has, like, two books. Mm. You know, like, you're not going to, you're not going to go, you're going to start you're not going to start where he left off. You're going to start from scratch. Like, why would you do that? No, totally. Yeah, uh, that is weird. Like, anytime you become aware that somebody doesn't read or even looks down upon reading, that's just like a huge sign that there's something about this person that you might not want to be so trustworthy. Well, there's two, there's two quotes. So Harry Truman said, not all readers are leaders, but all leaders are readers. Mm. I think that's a good one. And then the other one from Mark Twain, we think he said it, but he said... Um, a person who does not read has no advantage over someone who cannot read. Mm. So you're, if you don't read, you're functionally illiterate. Right. Like you're not any better than a person not smart enough to read. 100%. Uh, compare reading a full length book to reading, you know, a lot of people might read a bunch of articles throughout the day on their phone. Like sure. even for me in a day, yeah. if I am not picking up a book, I still might read 10 New York Times articles, yeah. which is, you know, great information, really well written, really well resourced is, is something really uh, valuable about it. But compare sure. that as an experience to what you get out of reading books. Well, I think it's a couple of things. So one, how often do you actually make decisions based on these articles you read? It's like, you're like, oh, here's some trivia about this politician. Here's some scandal about this athlete. Mm -hmm. You know, did you hear so-and-so did X? Right. Right. So that's not good. But um, so we tell ourselves that this stuff matters, but really we're just like gossiping. Mm. But the experience of sitting down quietly with a book in a corner uh, or, you know, as you're sitting in the waiting room of a dentist's office and just deciding to like get lost in this thing and to not have anything that can interrupt you, be it in your phone or other people, is like... A, an extraordinarily rare experience. I mean, like, what other part, like, for instance, when I fly, I don't, I'm flying to SF tonight, so it's an hour flight. But I'm not going to buy Wi-Fi. I'm not going to watch some shitty movie on the plane. I'm going to read for an hour. That's the best excuse to read right there. If you don't, like, even if you don't read any other time throughout the week, the flight is, yeah. I'm still married to that ritual. Yeah, read on the plane, read in the, I, driver took me here, I read in the back of the car. Like, I want to use dead time in my life and use it to, expand what I know about the world, give me ideas. Uh, Bismarck, I think he said, uh, you know, any fool can learn by experience. I want to learn from the experience of others. That's what I'm like. When you're sit, you see some person sitting in a corner reading, what they're doing is like cutting ahead of you in line. Mm. Like they, they are getting, they are learning things from people who have come before you or the smartest people in the world on this topic or that topic. 
and you're just, you know, continuing in ignorance. Well said. Do you uh, do you still have the same like note card style system that I've always uh, read? You write about it a couple of times, where you sort of collect the the best, most memorable parts of any book that you read, and that's yeah. a lot of. And you can feel it when you read your books that a lot of times it feels like you're you're coming back to lessons and stories that might have really stood out to you. Well, that's the thing. I'm not just like reading to impress people, or I'm not just reading for fun. Like if I'm going to do something for fun, I'm going to watch. Like we live in a golden age of television. <laughs> this is television. very true. Yeah. You know, like so if I'm if I'm going to be reading, I want to do something that makes me better as a re- as a person. And so I'm I'm folding pages. I'm writing. And the, like when I see a book, someone's like, "Here, I read your book," and it's like in perfect condition. Mm. I'm like, so you didn't get as much out of it as you could if you really like dug into the text. Right. So I take I take notes, and then yeah, I transfer all that to note cards. Right. Because I feel like that's one thing that I really like about the physical copies of books. Like, and I was thinking about it in comparison to movies. Is that if I read, if I watch a good movie, a lot of times, you know, I'll have a day or two of discussing it with people that I know, maybe mention it on a, on a podcast or uh, you know have a quick conversation about it on Twitter. For the most part, there's no real way for me to keep remembering it. But when I look at my bookshelf, it's just full of all these different memories I have of all these different books that made different impressions on me. And a lot of times, you know, I got curious about the author and I read more from that author. Um, and that that's a big part of why it's so important to me is to be able to look at that bookcase and just know that I have all these different things that I've already consumed. And if I were to start rereading one of them, it would instantly feel familiar. Yep. Like I can't really like if I reread a book, I don't it feels completely different. It's nice, but it's a completely different experience. Well, there's a the, one of the things the Stoics talk about. They go like no man steps in the same river twice. Mm. What they mean is the river has changed, right? Because the waters move, but also the man has changed. Mm. So you're technically reading the exact same book and nothing has changed in it, but you've changed and the context that you're reading has changed and the way that you perceive what you're reading has changed. So it is fundamentally different. Mm. And so every, everything is in a state of flux and being remade. Like if you read all the, reread all the books you read in high school right now, You'd be like, oh, I totally missed the point of that. Mm. It's because you were 17 and you didn't know anything. And that's kind of one of the perils of the information age, huh? That we are so surrounded by amazing content that it can be hard for people to find the time to go read something twice. Let alone alone once. And and then the second reading, though, might be really the thing that cements it into your brain, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, look, I've read Meditations 100, 150 times. Like, it's that deep, that's what people used to do with the Bible, right? Mm. You read this book your whole, over and over and over again, your whole life. In, in Judaism, I forget what it's called, but like you read, a, there's a passage you read, like a, the, the Torah is broken up in 52 chunks. Right. So every week for a year, every year of your life, you cycle through this book. And like you can imagine the level of understanding and knowledge and recall and that experience of like it hitting you different ways at different times. Like, you know, I don't know, but you read it when you're 12 and then you read it when you're 29 and then you read it when you're 60. Like... You're gonna have profoundly different reactions mm. and learn different things because, because actually, like if you heard, there's this expression when the when the student is ready, the teacher appears, mm. and so it's like your mind was finally ready to see something in that same book that you were closed off to before. Mm. That's very true. Um, one thing, like uh, another person I've read a lot of in my day is Sam Harris, and he's yeah. sort of really taken a step back from the podcast thing or from the book thing because of the podcast, and it feels like it's sheerly because of scale. Like he just yeah. straight up hits more people. You're somebody who seem like you're much more content with writing and that you're you're not really looking for a, a different medium, not to say that you don't ever do stuff outside of that, but yeah. what what is it exactly that keeps you so married to it? Well, to me, that's the form. I mean, if, if, if I was like, hey, Adam, I know you like riding a BMX, but like motorcycles are faster, <laughs> you'd be like, what? That, that's not the point. Like, this, yeah. is, this is where I express myself, right? Mm. So like, that's my, that's my craft. You can do different things on a, you know, a sampler than you can do on a guitar. But like, if you, if, if what you achieved mastery in is the guitar, that's your, that's your jam, Mm. you know? So, so part of it's just like, I'm a writer. That's how I see the world. That's what I love. That's what gets me up in the morning. But also though, it, it is important that people, that artists don't get too wedded to only reaching their people in one form. Mm. So like, with Daily Stoic, we have an Instagram account that's got, you know, three, four hundred thousand followers. We've got um, an email that goes out every day that's got, you know, hundreds of thousands of subscribers. We've got a, 
I do a podcast version of it that's done millions and millions of downloads, right? So it's like, I'm not super, I'm here talking on this show. And, right. you know, yesterday I was talking on some, you know, fancy, you know, pretentious show. Like, I'll, I'll go and meet and interact with people anywhere. But at the end of the day, like, where I'm truest in my thing is, is in, the, in the, like, pages of a book. <laughs> 